Have you ever just been in a grocery store or somewhere and given somebody a really big smile and they didn't really react the way you wanted them to and it puzzled you and you worried about it until you realized maybe the next day that you had a mask on? <laughs> we have, uh, yeah. I, I think evolution is taking over and, <laughs> having to wear masks, but you um, actually can see it in their eyes. You can. So there's my bad reaction. I can actually.
We can, can start tune in communicate now. with our eyes now. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing better. I was doing this the whole time, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Our call to worship is from Psalm 22. Uh, this is verses 25 through 31. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before him. Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him, indeed, shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to people yet to be born, saying that he has done it. We worship a God who deserves our praise because he is Lord of all. And thanks be to God for that. Pray with me, please. Almighty and gracious God, we are thankful to be gathered into your presence here. Thankful for the many things that we know you have done for us. Especially that we are reminded in many, many ways that you are Son, Lord of all creation. And so when we are tempted to offer our allegiances in other places. You are gracious to bring us back into your care and help us to know and understand that indeed you are Lord of all. So we give you our worship today, our praises, our prayers, and our thoughts, because we know that you are with us. It's in the name of Jesus we make this our prayer. Amen.
John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch can unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withered. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever seen the movie The Big Lebowski? Maybe you've seen it. <clears throat> the, the main character in the movie, played by Jeff Bridges, is Jeffrey Lebowski, but he refers to himself and insists that everybody else does as well. He refers to himself as the dude. And he lives by his strict philosophy of not doing anything. And it becomes his code. And the way he explains it is his motto. The dude abides. In that sense, abide may just mean linger. He just lingers. He just is. He kind of has this live and let live come what may outlook on life. That might not be the abiding Jesus is talking about here in John 15. In more contemporary definitions of the word abide, it can mean to linger. It can mean to tolerate. Um, and it's used colloquially in that way. Um, you may have seen pictures of our friend Sarah on Facebook this week as she has raided the Bitter Southerner store and gotten t-shirts and uh, a mask. Her new mask says on it, Abide No Hatred. I think that's a definitely a good code to live by. Abide no hatred. In an archaic, ancient translation, definition of the word abide, though, we understand that it means to dwell, to, to stay, to abide, to remain. Uh, the Greek word, the root of, of this word, Greek word is mino, which means stay. Um, or remain. If you read uh, Eugene Peterson's uh, translation of the Bible, the message, the line uh, abide in me that is very familiar to us, uh, it takes on new life as he puts it. Uh, he says in the message, live in me, make your home in me. So I, I, I mentioned this last week. It's a good uh, situation to bring it up again. Uh, when John the Baptist sends, lets his disciples go and, and check out Jesus, and they're kind of following after him as Jesus is walking along, and he turns around to them and says, what do you want? They ask him this question, where are you staying? It's the same Greek root here. Uh, two minutes, where are you abiding, we would translate. Where are you staying? Where are you living? And Jesus, of course, says, 
come and see. And that sets the tone for the rest <coughs> of the Gospel of John, especially in what it means to follow him. Here in, in chapter 15, he says to his disciples, uh, in, in his farewell address to them, so the, the undercurrent here is that they will have days when they are not physically present with Jesus. He will be gone. And Jesus' advice to them in how they anticipate that, abide in me. How do we abide in Jesus? Well, it has, <clears throat> it has a lot to do with where you are staying. Or, to tie it in more closely with the illustration Jesus uses here of a vine, where are you putting down your roots? Where are you staying? And so that question has... has plenty of depth to it for us to consider uh, that we think about in our relationship to Jesus, how we are rooted in him. Or to follow the illustration Jesus uses here, if he is that main stalk of the vine, and we are branches of the vine, everything we need to live on is coming through our connection with him. Where are you staying? Where are you putting down your roots? Well, perhaps we ought to think about this first um, in terms of where we should not stay. Again, we'll go back to the great philosophy of Sarah's mask, abide, no hatred. Abide, no hatred. Tolerate, no hatred. Hatred. Don't live there. And the same goes for meanness and cruelty. Abide, this one's, this is, this is your bumper sticker for today. Abide no intolerance. Do not tolerate intolerance. Okay? If there's anything you should have intolerance for, it is intolerance. Every. We okay? Uh -huh. I don't want to like give you whiplash with that. <laughs> Abide no bigotry. Abide no deceit. Abide no lies. And so on. You know right from wrong. And if you are connected with Jesus Christ, the reality of how well you know right from wrong is there, unless someone's been deceiving you. Abide no hatred, abide no meanness, abide no cruelty, abide no bigotry, abide no lies, and so on. Why? Because you can't live there. The hatred and cruelty and dishonesty and bigotry and intolerance may be convenient for a moment just to get what you want. But if you remain there, you will die. Because you will have put your roots down in a source that is evil. Abide no hatred. You can't live there. And you know as well as I do, that's great in the lecture, but how does it work in the lab? Because it takes work. It takes work for us to actually recognize evil when it shows up, because it just doesn't come all dressed in red with, you know, a, a cigarette and a long tip holder. I had a New Testament professor who actually would come to class once a semester 
dressed as Satan. He wore a red suit, and he had a bad toupee on. <laughs> and sometimes folks would talk about he would even smoke. Um, it became, you know, it was, it was fun to watch the obvious representation of evil, but sometimes it doesn't really work out that way. If you've seen the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, when the heroes in that movie pick up Tommy at the crossroads, he's been at that crossroads late at night to sell his soul to the devil. And somebody asks him, well, what does the devil look like? Everett McGill jumps in and says, well, it's obvious. Everybody knows what the devil looks like. He's red and scaly with a bifurcated tail, and he carries a hay fork. And Tommy corrects him and says, oh, no. No, sir, the devil is white, as white as you folks. We shouldn't let that line pass us by, because evil can show up in a pretty package, dressed in ways that might be tolerable to us. It's kind of like boiling the frog, if you are familiar with that picture. If you, if you get a kettle of water just to a rolling boil, and you throw a frog in, it will leap right out. Hopefully anybody else would, too. But if you gradually, if you put him in, the, in, in pool water and gradually turn up the heat, you can boil that frog. Now, I'm, have no recipes for boiled frogs, so I can't really help you anywhere beyond that. A, a great quote has stuck with me for a long time. So long that I don't remember where it comes from. Temptation creeps in through the doors we leave cracked open. Sometimes we find ourselves abiding in the places where we should not stay because we have manufactured the conditions for it to suit ourselves. And instead of recognizing the darkness, we have allowed it to creep in bit by bit. So what do we do? What's the solution? Well, it's obvious. Instead of abiding where we should not be, Jesus says it very plainly, abide in me. Abide in Jesus. Live in him. Make your home in Jesus. And how do we do that? This image of the vine is, is very important here. Uh, the vine, the grapevine, was a great symbol for Israel. And Jesus kind of grabs that very familiar symbol for his audience and uses it as, as an illustration. I don't know anything about growing grapes. Any of y'all own a vineyard or have worked on one? I don't know anything about grapes. But I know a lot about tomatoes. Growing up in the springtime, my father um, would plant tomatoes. And what you need to know about my dad is he can't resist a good deal. And if you're selling something, he will talk you into helping him get a better deal. Um, one time, he and I were together, and there was a man with a truckload of watermelons. And... I walked over there first. How much are the watermelons? $3 a piece. Okay, I'll take two. And I paid $6 for the watermelons. I heard my dad as he walked over to that truck. He asked the same question I did. How much are the watermelons? $3 a piece. Will you take two for five? And he, well, he gave him $5 and came back with two watermelons. And he has the skill of picking out a better watermelon than I can, so he came back with two really good watermelons. <clears throat> he cannot resist a deal. So when he goes and buys a flat of tomato plants, 
he discovers that if he buys two flats of tomato plants, he has a better deal. And he also understands the yield that will come from them a couple of months later. He also understands the free labor he has at home <laughs> that helps him plant 95 yields of tomato plants. And he knows that we will stake them and tie them to the stakes with him and go out there and hoe around the plants and fertilize them and all of the benefits of having children. But he also taught us how to grow them. And when the tomatoes got so high and were about to blossom, he says, it's time to sucker these plants. I was like, what does that mean? He had to explain to me that <clears throat> as runners come off the vine, as, as, as branches come off the main stalk of the vine, between that main stalk and the new branch would be a smaller vine in the middle. And if you don't pinch that little sucker off, S-U-C-C-O-U-R, I think it's... <laughs> But yes, <laughs> spell it the other way too. If you don't pinch that off, it steals nutrients from the vine going to the branch. And if you don't pinch it off, you don't get a good tomato out there on the end of that new branch. You have to sucker the vine. You have to prune it. You have to, and this is where the term green thumb came from, I believe, because as you pinch little stalks off of your tomato vines, you will have one, and, and this finger as well, um, and you'll forget it, and you'll have green here as well. <clears throat> so Jesus uses this illustration of the vine, but all with a note of judgment. If you're part of the vine, but you're not producing good fruit, you're going to get pruned off. You're going to get cut off, and you're going to dry out, and you're going to be burned up because um, abiding in this vine is not about lingering. Abiding in the vine implies productivity. We, we struggle to explain sometimes what it means to uh, be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, we put difficult images out there. Um, we sing a hymn about letting Jesus come into your heart. Um, a child asked a friend of mine, well, won't that hurt? And he struggled with that. He tried and tried and tried to explain, but the kid wasn't going, <laughs> wasn't going to budge off of, does that hurt? And I, I said, maybe, you know, we should stick with follow me. Discipleship in the Gospel of John is described that way. Jesus, as Jesus calls his disciples, he tells them, follow me. So abiding with Jesus, living with him, making our home in him, is, is built on the idea that we will follow him, that we will do the things that Jesus does, that we will adopt his teachings as our code to live by. So abiding then implies productivity. We are challenged that in our following Jesus, in our discipleship, we must bear good fruit. Otherwise, we run the risk of being cut off and thrown away. Bear good fruit. And if you are, uh, if you've been to Vacation Bible School enough, you know what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. And you can read it. You can get the exhaustive list in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And what follows that list is very important. No law stands against these things. So 
So we abide in Jesus. We make our home in him. We live in him. In him we find life. Stay with Jesus and don't get cut off. Remain in Jesus and make him the standard by which you live. And when you do this, you bear good fruit. You're able to do this because you have put down your roots. You have made your home in Jesus. You have put down your roots in an important way to live. Mostly that you have learned to love one another. Amen. God leads us along all three verses. comes from 1 John chapter 4. And this is verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. In the name of a loving God, we have gathered together. And in the name of a loving God, we depart to serve. Amen. Amen. Thank you.